Hello, Emma. Is Amy Lee coming? I think so. Sometimes she's a minute late. I haven't heard anything that she wasn't coming, but at least we're filming today and she's not. So, okay. Um, I have not graded your corrections yet because I like to sit down and grade everything at one time and I have nothing else to grade this week, so I just decided that you guys would be okay waiting another week for those corrections to come back. So, I hope that's okay. I hope that doesn't mess you up too much. And also, I wanted to tell you guys that um, because registrations, I guess, maybe starts today. Today. I think it's due today. today. It was due today. I don't, since I don't have, since I'm not registering kids, I'm not totally up on it. But I have been, was thinking about my group for next year and thinking about you guys and just thinking that I don't think I could, there's any way I could have a group. Hey, anyone. As good as this group next year. Like, I just feel like it's, that would be impossible. And maybe I will. But y'all have been an amazing group. Like, I just, you're my guinea pigs. Thank you for bearing with me as I'm learning how to do this. Um, but I just feel like I have just the perfect heart. You're just smart, enthusiastic, and you bring energy. And you make it fun and easy and make me want to do it. So I'm just very thankful. I think God knew if I was going to do this more than one year, he had to give me a good group and he gave me a great group. So, <laughs> thank, thank you guys. So, no, I forgot my hands today. Sharpies. You can borrow the mic. We might, like, write my board writing. No, there's, no, there's one on here. Okay. Away. Here's one of these. Okay. Um, how was the test? Good. Okay. Well, I have some other news that I think you'll think is great news. I told Jennifer Parker on the phone this morning. She was happy about it. Um, okay, so I was thinking about module 14 and spring break coming up. And I know you a lot of you are very busy with running right now, and the honors kids are working on their papers. So I'm trying to make things a little simpler. I really want you to take a test before spring break and have a break. So, I thought about module 14 also, and I'll, I'll be completely honest with you, I'm really busy too, and I'm kind of tired doing Quizlet. So, <laughs> it's not just for you, it's for me too, it's for everybody. What I decided to do for module 14, we are not gonna have Quizlets, okay? And so if you're somebody like Solomon that loves Quizlet that Oh, that's, you know, that's a bummer. I really learned well on Quizlet. You can get on Quizlet and just search Apology of Biology Module 14, and other people will have done Quizlet. They probably won't be as detailed as mine are, um, but you can still study terms that way if you, if you want to, but you really don't have to. The Module 14 test is coming straight from the study guide in Appendix B. So, as far as I'm concerned, the only thing that you have to study, if you know and understand the answers to the study guide and the answers to Appendix B, um, and you know there may be something, and I'll, I'll tell you this next week, like there's a figure in the book that really applies to one of those questions, like you may want to go back and review that figure, but I'm going to take the test straight from the study guide and straight from Appendix B. How, how does that sound to everybody? Amazing. <laughs> oh, like, you thing. mean like verbatim or like uh, probably, probably some verbatim and some not verbatim. Mm -hmm. And I'm especially, uh, I would say with the honors kids, you know, I will have some discussion stuff and I'll take it. I probably won't make it verbatim, but I will make sure that when I'm writing the questions that someone who just studied those two things should and was paying attention in class, should know what the answers are, okay? Um, again, stay on task, get that test on Friday, okay? The other thing is for honors, I had had the due date for the paper for the Thursday when we get back after spring break. I am going to give the option 
to, so that is which way? Wait, the the wet. Is it the twenty? No, it's the fourteen. Oh, sorry, the fourteen. Mm -hmm. The fourteen. Uh, so, um, is it, so on the directions it says three to four pages, it needs to be three to four pages long. Is that three to four full pages? Or I mean, at least, it at least needs to be three full pages, yes. Okay. Yes, okay. And remember, when you do your citations in there, that takes up space. Oh, so the citations now. Yeah, well, like, like in text, not the word, not the not, not the, the word cited, cited, but that oh, takes up okay. space in your text, so that makes that makes it a little bit longer. Okay, that's going to make it be a little bit longer. Okay, so you may turn it in that Thursday after spring break, which we're not totally sure what that date is, and I'm sorry that I can't look it up on my phone. Well, spring break is the sixth, so it'll be fourteenth. Okay, okay. Um, or. You may email it to me by the following Tuesday, by the following Tuesday, which is April 18th. Okay, so you can either bring it to class on Thursday, or I'm giving you like an extra weekend in case because I want you to take time off over spring break. So if you need that extra weekend, the the final date that it has to be in by is it can be emailed to me by Tuesday, April 18th. If that's helpful to anybody. Okay. Then we have your presentation part of that, okay? Um, and so the dates I have to do the presentation are April 20th, April 27th, and May 4th, okay? And so I want you to pick out, we need to get signed up for the dates that we're going to do the presentation. I can't have more than two people on one of those dates. Okay, so April 20th, which would be not the Thursday right after spring break, but the next Thursday. Can I do that one? That's what you want? Okay, so let me go Google that. We've got April 27th. So that's, you're taking April, you're taking April 20th. And two people can take April 20th. I didn't have a pen. I did bring my bag of all my pens. Does anybody have a pen that I can borrow for today? Um, so sorry. I have some goodness gracious. I have one. Colored pencil. Is it do you like a pencil? Anything will be the right thing. Okay. Okay, so I'm I I'm at the twenty sixth. I think it's twenty seven. I think it's twenty six. am I wrong? You think it's the twenty six? Okay. Because I think the twenty seven should be really small and that's a Friday. No. I think No, it's the twenty eight twenty eight. Oh, okay. I think it's the 27th. Okay, so you guys are doing that second week. Okay, so Emma and Ellery. So Amy Lynn, that leaves you with May 4th or April 20th. Okay. Okay. Okay, what, and uh, Solomon and Miranda, forgive me for talking honor stuff. No, we're okay. Okay. We have a little time to do that today, so. What else has everybody gotten done on the papers? I pretty much have incidents down. Okay. Like okay, okay. So you've been working, okay. I have a plan for what I want to do. And like your, kind of kind of like, like your outline? Yeah, like what I want you to paragraph to say, and then I have to have to Okay, good, okay. I like my facts and like sources and things like so like. Okay. Or not necessarily paragraph, mm -hmm. I do it per prompt. So I, that's can, how I would have done it. So too. then I can look mm -hmm. at the yes. and decide what needs to be kind of Yes. So I did it per prompt. Okay. And then I kind of had a question about mm -hmm. the peer reviewed article. Mm -hmm. I think I found what I want, but I can't figure out how to see the whole thing. Did you talk to Ellie? So PubMed is all peer reviewed journals. You can go to PubMed. Mm -hmm. I know. And I like typed it in and mm -hmm. I found the one. You have to put the girl in her Okay, when you see, okay, yeah, I can show you. I, so I have all of the sources. Okay, you can do this too, Emma. You can send me, it, 
you could um, email me the link to that one and I can get on there and see. Some articles you can't without buying them. But there's like some a certain stipulation, so I may need to look at it, but also talk to Ellery about it. Well, and I did like the you can filter it where it's only free, and I did that too. Uh huh. Like we can buy it. And I still can figure out how to open it. So. Okay, I may need to play with it, but I'll also get okay. Ellery, Ellery to look at it. Okay. Any other questions about that? And remember, for your presentation, you need to have some kind of visual aid. Okay. All right. Okay. Then, um, okay. Other thing I want to tell you guys is, oh, Amy Lynn, go ahead. I don't know if you said this, mm -hmm. okay. uh, but what is the presentation about? Like, is it, is it about the research? It's on, go back and read your handouts I gave you. Yes, it's about your your disease. Yes, and so I think it tells, and I can't even. I, it's, so you got a sheet on there about the research paper and presentation. Um, yes, it is about your paper. It is about your paper. Let's we'll, we'll see what it says on here. I can't even. I cannot even remember exactly what I said about the research paper. Um, I think I have it somewhere. But. So I you will do a six to eight minute presentation for the class covering the information from your paper. You will need to include a visual aid as part of your presentation. And that's it. So I have a question. Will we like be reading our paper or will no. we just kind of go over like the Definitely papers? do not read it. Okay. Yes. Do not read the paper. You're going to go over the highlights and even if it's five minutes. Let's say it needs to be at least five minutes and no more than eight minutes, okay? But it is, you know, it doesn't need to be as technical as your paper because you're just educating your peers about that disease and, and making sure that they understand about that disorder. Does visual aid include like a handout? A or visual aid can be a handout. Okay. It could be a poster. I'm totally fine with a handout. It could be a poster. It could be a PowerPoint. I mean, what you know of course we're i feel like we're limited technology wise down here with the internet so don't be dependent on the internet but yes i a handout is fine it does not have to be some elaborate um visual yeah. aid and then also i guess if we had like a you know a trifle or something we could kind of yes that I try but are we allowed to have like a sheet of paper with certain facts? Oh yes, oh yes. Put say. your stuff on index. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I don't expect you to have the whole presentation memorized. I mean, it'd be good if you're not sitting there reading from your cards the whole time. You don't want to do that. But yes, you definitely are going to need something to be able to refer to and look down at. Anything else? We good? Okay. And again, if anybody needs me to come early next week. Just message me, um, and I'm, I'm happy to um, come in and, and work with you. Okay. All right. I looked up the salmon, and it said that they will always attempt to go back to their birthplace, and that sometimes they'll die doing it, um, that they'll try so hard that they'll actually they'll die doing it. But if, that some of them, if they can't get back to their birthplace, so if something happened like that area was had dried out or something happened to it, then sometimes they will find other salmon and go to their birth. They will go with other salmon. So only if they know that it's like safe. Right. It will only be with other salmon. They wouldn't go like independently. It would be like a group. Um, and then I also read um, a bunch of stuff about the, um, the farm salmon and kind of how it's done and I still don't completely understand the spawning aspect of it but it was really depressing <laughs> I'm just gonna tell you it was just like that they put these like bat things like out in the ocean that like close them in and it's a lot of it's off the coast of Chile and just like thousands of salmon swimming up close to each other and they don't um, develop the pink color because it's the they're not in cold enough waters to kind of develop that natural pink color from the fat that their wild caught salmon have and so they actually put inject like dyes in them to give them the pinker color 
and um, it just said a lot of them end up getting um, damaged because they're swimming into each other and they just are like swimming in circles. It just, it's just depressing. <laughs> it's depressing. <laughs> so I say eat wild caught when you can. Okay. All right. So we are in Kingdom Plante. Okay, so we are finally in a different kingdom. We're in Kingdom Plante. And what is the study of plants called? And what would be the scientist that studies plants called? Botany. Botany. Botanist. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, plants are producers of oxygen which we need to breathe, but um, do plants produce most of our oxygen? Amen. No. No. Who does? Um, plankton. The phytoplankton. And you, who remembers this? This would really impress me. What kingdom the phytoplankton are from? Anybody remember? <laughs> Protista. Good job. They are from Protista. Good. Okay. So we have different kinds of plants. We have plants that come back year after year that typically are going to have a woody stem. What are those plants called, the ones that come back year after year? Perennials. Perennials. Okay. And what about the ones that just last for a year? Annual, so those are going to be like your pansies that you plant. Um, what about ones that come that last for two years? The first year they're storing food, the second year they're reproducing. Amy Lynn, biennials. Okay, all right. Um, and so this chapter goes a lot into different kinds of plant tissues. But one thing I want to make sure that everybody understands is that what tissues are, okay? And so we know what is the building block of life? Random. So, cell. Okay? So if the cell is the building block, a group of cells together are tissues, okay? So tissue is made up of a group of cells, okay? A group of tissue together makes up an organ, okay? And then several organs together make up an organ system, okay? So you've got cells, they're making up tissue, and let's say that they're making up the tissue that makes up your stomach. Okay, and then your stomach, your esophagus, your small intestine, your large intestine, all that together is going to make up your digestive system. So tissue is just a group of cells, but we have different types of tissues that the chapter talks about in plants. Okay, um, the chapter also talks about two different types, two categories of organs in plants. Does anybody remember what those two categories are, Ellery? The large colossal? No. Or the no. No. Okay. no. Emma? The negative and the reproductive. Okay. 
vegetative and reproductive. And so reproductive is an organ that has anything to do with reproduction. So it's a lot of times going to have seeds. Okay. And then the vegetative is um, any part of the plant that is not involved in reproduction, like stems, roots, and leaves. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> typically, reproductive plant organs technically are all fruits. Okay. But we don't always necessarily think of them as fruits because we think of fruits as being a little bit sweeter and having more simple sugars, more um, fructose in them. Um, but any kind of food that you eat that's encapsulating seeds is technically a fruit. So, and I know you probably have heard that about tomatoes, but tomatoes are actually a fruit. Um, but peppers would be the same way, peas and corn. Bananas. Um, what? Bananas. Bananas. Mm -hmm. I didn't think about that. You remember? Yeah. 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 Okay. So if you think of banana, but banana, but we think of banana as a fruit. Yeah. 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 But I think I'm talking about about like things that you think of as a vegetable. So I used to think of it as a fruit. I mean, as a vegetable. Sorry. So pumpkin would technically be a fruit. Yes. So pumpkin squash, all of those are technically fruit, but when dietitians are categorizing them, they're looking at them as a vegetable because they do not have like the same sugar content. dermatologist is the skin doctor. So you remember that anything with derma in it is going to be like an outer skin. Okay, so the dermal tissue um, is going to make up the epidermis of the plant. It is going to protect the plant from, protect the inside organs. It's going to protect the plant from bacteria and fungi. It's also going to be responsible for absorbing um, water and minerals. It's going to protect plant from bad things coming in. Um, okay, so that is going to be the dermal tissue. What about the tissue of undifferentiated cells? What in the world does that mean? What are undifferentiated cells, Miranda? Cells that have not specialized in any particle function. Okay. So, so I like, I, I think you can think of it like this. They are cells that are figuring out what they're what their life mission is, okay? They have not figured it out yet, all right? <laughs> um, they are trying to, they haven't decided who they're gonna be or what they're gonna be yet, what their career's gonna be. So what kind of tissue is that, Miranda? Meristematic. So meristematic, okay? And there's lots of mitosis, that meristematic, so mitosis, remember, is when the cells are dividing, making identical cells, okay? So lots of mitosis is going on. You're forming new cells. That's where growth is happening, but those cells still haven't figured out who they're going to be yet. Okay, now what kind of tissue is the most common tissue where... Um, it has a, performs a variety of functions. These cells have figured out what they're going to do. 
They might store starches in oil. They may be involved in metabolism or photosynthesis. Solomon? Brown tissue. Ground tissue. So that's going to be your, most of your tissue in your plant is going to be ground tissue. And Anglin, I think it's appropriate that you tell us about the next kind of tissue since this is kind of like involves your dad in some way, it connects to your dad. What's the last kind of tissue? <laughs> vascular tissue. So vascular tissue, and what happens in the vascular tissue? Anglin. Um, it is used to carry water and dissolve material throughout the plant. The mm -hmm. uh, xylem stuff carries the water and the, the mm -hmm. minerals and stuff, and then the phloem carries the sugar and organic stuff and stuff. Okay, so... They're kind of like veins. Exactly. So for your, is, is your dad a vascular surgeon? Mm -hmm. Okay, so he's a vascular surgeon. Okay, so, so we have veins. Plants have the xylem and the phloem. Okay, that's their vascular tissue. That's what carries substances throughout the plant. So those are like the veins of the plant. So that's going to be vascular tissue. And, and that was right. That was a great description of xylem and phloem. Um, which one between xylem and phloem die, the cell, do the cells actually die when they mature? And which ones um, do the cells continue to live after they mature? And, uh, the xylem die and then the phloem continue to live. Right. Exactly. Okay. All right. So now let's turn to page um, 14, 1. And um, what? Sorry, it's page 431, figure 14-1. Okay, you know what is throwing me is I'm looking, I like to check time throughout class to make sure we're running okay, and because my clock, the clock's not on the wall and my phone's up there, can I borrow your watch to keep up here? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, perfect. Okay, so let's look at the leaf structure. And what is the primary portion of the leaf? What we think of the leaf, what is that part of the leaf called, Miranda? The leaf? No. The blade. Okay, and what is the tip of the blade called? The apex. The apex. And then what is the stalk of the of the actual leaf that attaches it to the tree called, Miranda? Petiole. Petiole. And then the tiny little leaf-like appendages kind of at the base of the petiole, they almost look like tiny little leaflets and they're going to kind of cover that leaf when that leaf starts to form, Emma. The stipules. Okay. All right. I think we got that. And let's, so let's go ahead and turn the page to 432. And we've got, I think this is very straightforward. The simple leaf, which is just going to be one leaf attached to the petiole. And then we've got the compound leaf, which you're going to have a single petiole and multiple leaflets arranged on it. So is that why when you see these, you don't automatically see the stipules? Because it's just where the petiole is coming off of like the branch. Mm -hmm. It's not where each individual leaf is coming off the petiole. Yes, yes. I feel like right now, because the trees are just starting to leaf back out, we'll probably see. You, you probably are going to see that it's probably an easier time to see the stipules right now too. Um, if you want to look at some trees that where the leaves are starting to leaf out, it's probably it's a really good time. I think that this um, curriculum um, organized that that purposely put these plant chapters where they did so that you would be studying the plants in the spring. Um, so that you could see these things, because typically plants actually would come earlier in the plant every biology book I've ever done. Plants come much earlier, so I like the way you did that. Okay. Is there any difference in this book? It's before, actually. It's oh, it is? Oh, it is? Mm -hmm. I kind of like it. I kind of like where it is. All right, but you told me you didn't like the new, te the new textbook, wasn't it? So your brother does the new mm -hmm. textbook? That he doesn't. And they did it a while ago, so. Okay. They did not. This module. Okay. Jackson, this is not a textbook. Yeah, because he's got two kids. Oh. I feel like they just what? in the earthworm like just now, like mm -hmm. so they just yeah. in the earthworm. Yeah. I'm so glad Mary finished that. 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So we've got a lot of different shapes um, in figure 14.4 on page 433. Um, again, I think there's probably others. This is probably not a complete chart. This is probably kind of the most common ones. Um, I don't, I want you to kind of have a general understanding. I am probably, I'm not planning to ask you, like, put some obscure leaf on there and say <laughs> exactly what shape. You don't have to have every one of those names memorized. But what I do want you to know is that there are charts that exist to help you match up. And so, you know, in your life, if you want to identify something, you can always get on Google, look up leaf shapes. You can find the biological key um, also online, and you can that can help you identify what something is. So you have the skills with your eyes, the internet, and biological keys to figure out any kind of tree. You buy a house one day and you don't know what the tree is. You make observations. You get on the internet and you figure out what kind of tree it is. Okay? Wonderful. So helpful. All right. Um, so with the um, what shapes did you uh, what shapes did you guys have on your leaves? Pull out your stuff now. Yeah. Talk about that for a minute. Let's see. Here, Martin. Let's feel like pass this around. This looks good. Okay. All right. So this looks like in a piece of ivy. This came off of ivy. Oh, you make the page. Okay. Oh, you put this in your notebook? Yeah, yeah. that's what you're supposed to do. It. Mm -hmm. Won't they just look disintegrate after a little, little bit? Uh, they probably You will. have to press them, like, <laughs> if you press them in, like, um, a, a really heavy book, then Those they won't. Those are pressed press them. Yeah, they're not. But, but you can press them. Oh, we'll just put them in a heavy book. So this has got the underlay. So they are pressed. I don't think those are pressed. They are. Okay. Okay, that has a, a, a serrated. serrated margin. So you think about a serrated knife like a bread knife. It's got the tiny little, little points. This was actually a really good lab. And I think it was a great lab, but I really wanted to give you guys time. So, but I like, I think this is a great lab. It's a good one to do at home. Okay. Um, oh, look at that one. That's got a different edge on it. <laughs> I know. Like, I don't know what my own leaf look like. You know, what does it look like? And so, you know, this also is a little bit hard because the trees haven't completely leaked uh, out. Oh, yeah. Right and that's what I was going to say. Just rip off the page. <laughs> you know, well, yeah, but before, before, I, before I thought of that, I'd already okay. put this together. <laughs> Why don't you write a little more on your conclusion? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, let me see. Okay. <laughs> I have three sentences. Okay. Just make it sound like you're passionate about what you're doing. <laughs> Honestly, no. <laughs> so, so, so that was a lesson from the fall, I guess, that had fallen. I think that one of our stuff said it kind of. Yeah, so you broke off some of it. Yeah, I just felt really good. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
I think the edges of it are smooth. I mean, it, but, but you know what? Mine hasn't leaked out yet. So when it leaks out, I'll get, we'll get some leaks. So, like, like for these, like, for denting and stuff, like, does the whole thing have to be dented? What happens if part of the leak is smooth? Like, entire, has an entire margin. What do you call it? If part of the leaf is Yeah, what if part of the leaf is entire when and part of the leaf is dentate? I don't know. I don't think that it would be. I don't know. Maybe it would be well. You find me a leaf like that. And then we'll use the biological to figure it out. Okay. And then we also are going to be looking at the venation. So that's going to be in figure 14.6. And so those are like the veins, venation veins that run through the leaf, and we've got the parallel venation, so there's three straight lines running down. The pinnate, which you're going to have one mid rib, one mid vein coming through, and then the branches are going to be coming off, off of that. And then the palmate is going to look more, a little more netted, because you're going to have the mid rib, you're going to have branches coming off the mid rib, and then more branches coming off of that. So probably, my guess is that a, a wider shaped leaf is going to be more likely to be palmate because you're going to need more little branches coming off of it. Um, that's my guess. Okay, so let's look at the on your own on 14.4. And um, Solomon, why don't you tell me what you got for A? Um, well, the shape would be double, right? Mm -hmm. The margin would be serrate, mm -hmm. and then the venation would be pinnate. Good. Okay. Um, who's going to take B? I can take B. Okay, Ellery. It is lobed, mm -hmm. undulate, and palm. Now, I got entire for that one. Yeah. I got entire too. I think it's so. Oh, I wrote, so yeah. lobed is the. Yeah, lobed, lobed is that shape. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You, um, but I understand why you. I I can see how you would get that. Okay. C. <laughs> Who's gonna take C? England. It's cleft, palmate, and looks entire maybe. Either that or dentate. Dentate. See those little points. I mean, I see so it has. I, I would say this. This kind of goes back to Naomi's question. Actually, looking at that leaf, I think that if it has any any dentate on it, then it would be dentate, even if some parts were smooth. I think you would classify it as. See that leaf. See how the bottom part looks entire, <coughs> but the top looks dentate. I think you go with if it has any serration, you go with that serration, even if there's some sections that are smooth. I think that's the answer for that. Okay. Um, let's, oh, what about D? Who wants, who's, um, who's got D? Naomi? Do you find the shape is linear, uh -huh. um, the margin is entire, and the nation is parallel. Okay. Um, I, I actually, the first time I looked at that one for the venation, I put undulate. Um, I did that too. And then when I went back and checked the answer, it said, <laughs> right, but I can understand why somebody yeah, would. Like, they're tricky. <laughs> yeah, like, that one was a little unclear there. Okay. Okay, so let's now turn to page 436. And we're looking at um, the microscopic structure of a leaf under a microscope, and what do we have on the outside of both the top of the leaf, so this is a leaf like this, that so we've got the top on the top and the bottom on the bottom. What is that outer layer of cells on both the top and the bottom called? Ellery? The epidermis. The epidermis, okay. Now, tell me how the, um, CO2 gets into the leaf. So that photosynthesis can happen. How does it get in there, Ellery? It actually goes through the bottom, and there are, is it the stoma, or what receives the CO2 and distribute it throughout the leaf, but they are guarded by these guard cells that can open and close according to whether or not the weather is right 
to reduce CO2, which I think is part of why it's not like the main producer of oxygen is because it's not constantly taking CO2 and distributing it. Like, it's not it's constantly mm -hmm. releasing oxygen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a good, that's a good, that's a good option. That's good. I like that. Okay. So, I think of this, the stomata or the stoma, those are the holes where the, um, the CO2 can come in and the oxygen can go out. I think of those kind of like spiracles. So we were talking about spiracles with some of our fish and with um, our arthropods um, and some of our um, insects. Um, they're kind of like holes for gas exchange, okay? And yes, there are guard cells right there that can open and close. And those guard cells are gonna open and close depending on conditions, okay? Um, and so when the guard cells um, are going to, so hold on one second, let me make sure I'm telling you this all right. So when the light levels are low, the stomata are gonna be closed. When the light levels are high, they're gonna be open, okay? And when the light levels are high, the photosynthesis is happening and when photosynthesis is happening, the plant is producing glucose. So we're going right back to some of that information from the first semester that Amy really enjoyed so much. Okay, so the plant is producing glucose, which is a sugar. And when you get a higher sugar concentration in that cell, what do you think happens in that cell when you've got Got more sugar in the cell. This actually is not in the book. It's just me hoping y'all are going to remember something from last semester. So you get this higher sugar concentration in the cell. And what do you think happens? Moves well. It's when water moves in. So that causes water to move into the cell. So that's going to cause that cell to swell. When that cell swells, it opens. Okay. The stomata, the stoma is going to open. Um, in low light conditions, when there's not um, as much photosynthesis going on and it's not producing the sugars, there's not going to be as much water in the, in the cell. And so that's going to cause the stomata to not be as swollen and it's actually going to close. Okay? All right. Um, why would the stomata need to be closed. How, how is that offering protection? Well, they're letting it get easily. Okay, that's a good guess, but that's not exactly what it is. So oh, why would it evaporate? Right, so it goes back to transpiration from our ecology chapter. And so, and so it keeps the water in the leaf, in the plant. Okay, all right. Any other questions about, about that? Okay, so now let's, we've looked at our epidermis, we've looked at where our stomata, our stoma is, and our guard cells. And then we've got that densely packed area under the top of the leaf epidermis. And that, it, what is that called and what's going on there? Oh, sure. <laughs> That's okay. So that, that kind of up under the top of the leaf, that top epidermis, what is that section called? And who knows why, what is going on there? This is the palisade mesophyll. So yeah, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the palisade mesophyll. Mm -hmm. you oh, no, you're right. Do you know what's going on there? Um, it's going to be doing photosynthesis, right? Yeah. Or yes. Yeah. Yes. So it's going to be. It's going to have a lot of chlorophyll in it, and it's going to be doing photosynthesis. Okay. So and it's very densely. That area is very densely packed. So you think about all those little chloroplasts and they're densely packed, how are all of those chloroplasts 
attaching light. Do you remember LRE? The cytoplasmic streaming. The cytoplasmic streaming. And I can't remember, but in first semester, we have watched a video and it was some kind of, it, it wasn't a plant. I don't know which kingdom it was from. I don't know if it was maybe from Protista. I think it was like bacteria. Bacteria, was Monera. Kind of bacteria. Where it showed cytoplasmic streaming. So that's like the cytoplasm, that gel within the cell, and you've got all those little um, microtubules and microfibers causing movement of the organelles within the cell. And so that those chloroplasts are moving around to catch the light, to maximize their catching the light with cytoplasmic streaming in that palisade mesophyll. And what is the area under the palisade mesophyll that looks a little more loose with like kind of some gaps and holes in it? What is that called? And it's named appropriately because it's named after something that has gaps and holes in it. Ellery? The spongy mesophyll. The spongy mesophyll. And Ellery, do you remember what goes into those gaps and holes? Why those gaps and holes are needed? Is it water? Or it is, is it the CO2? It's the CO2. Okay, so that, so think about it. That's, that is the stoma are on the bottom, okay? And so that CO2 can come in and it has all those holes in the spongy mesophyll. So it has space for the CO2 to come in. And then in the middle there, we have the vein with the xylem, the phloem, and then the, the one thing that wasn't mentioned earlier, the colon chyma, which are thick walled cells that help support the vein of the leaf. Okay. All right. Any questions about that? Then we're going to move on to 438 and 439 and talk a little bit about colors and leaves, leaves falling off the trees. Okay. So what, what makes leaves green? Chlorophyll. Chlorophyll. Okay. Um, what about plants that are yellow and orange? What is making them yellow or orange? Is chlorophyll the only kind of substance that's giving color to our plants? Solomon? Is it carotenoids? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So carotenoids are what makes carrots and sweet potatoes and pumpkins and squash the color that they are. And carotenoids um, and all of the different colors that come in fruits and vegetables are also in this the benefit of having a teacher who's a dietitian. They are also nutritionally so good for us and help prevent a lot of diseases, um, which is why it's so important to eat a variety of fruits and vegetables um, throughout the day, every day, and eat a lot of colors. And we know a lot about the benefits of the different carotenoids, but we don't know everything. And we don't know that certain carotenoids kind of interact with certain vitamins and minerals and help us absorb them better. And so when people say, well, I don't eat fruits and vegetables, I just take a bunch of vitamins. Well, you don't know what's in your food that's helping you absorb all of those vitamins and minerals. And, and carotenoids have been shown, carotenoids and other colors like the anthocyanins have been shown to actually help with absorption, so it's important. Yes, Miranda. Um, does that mean like those like red and orange leaves like are good for us? Like we can eat them? Like the red and orange leaves that fall from trees? Mm -hmm. No, no, just just stick with the food that's red and orange. <laughs> 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 about how teas, you know, are, have the tannic acid in the teas. Um, and tea is good for us, but we can also overdo tea. And tannic acid can actually bind to iron and not allow the iron to be absorbed 
And so when I was a dietitian at the health department working with kids, um, and it's a lot of um, kind of like lower income families that would come in, so it's when I was in graduate school, um, we would have young kids that would get sweet tea in their bottles. Okay. That we're drinking a lot of tea, okay? And well, we always at the health department we check their mm -hmm. iron levels, and a lot of these kids—I mean, you could even tell like under their eyes, they kind of had like bluish color. Um, they were iron deficient, and my guess was that it had a lot to do with them drinking drinking tea. So it really is not a good idea to be giving to drink tea all the time and to be giving little kids tea and and really even to be drinking sweet tea <laughs> um you know that's like drinking soda all the time so just you know you need to limit the sugar but just even if you're drinking i actually drink unsweet tea my parents were northerners so we when we had tea at, house, at home iced tea at home it was unsweet and that's what i like that's what's refreshing to me mm -hmm. but it still would not be a good idea to be drinking tea all the time you need to be drinking water and other things too okay um, all right, so let's um, talk a little bit about a little bit more about the leaf color. So, if a leaf is green, does it ha could it have carotenoids in it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. It's just that the chlorophyll overwhelms the other colors, and so that's what's going to shine and show. So that's what you're going to see. But it's still put. Okay. And so then we have another category of pigments called. Are y'all okay? No, she was just choking earlier. Oh. Okay. Well, uh, I was coughing because I just swallowed from the wrong way. So okay. I can do it. I'm okay. Okay. So we have the anthocyanins, okay? And those pig those are pigments also. And they're going to be different colors depending on the pH. Okay, so if you have the blue hydrangeas in your yard, like they, they get the big blue fluffy flowers on them. Um, those are very pH dependent. So those are going to be, the anthocyanins are going to be like, make like your purples, your reds, and your blues, okay? And so if those are in an acidic pH, you're going to have a really good blue color. If they are in a more basic pH, it's going to be more pink, purple. And so I have a lot of those in my yard. My yard's really wide. And on one side of, of my, I have this like wide screen porch off the back. And on one side of the screen porch, the hydrangeas are blue, just blue, blue, blue. And then as you go further in my yard, closer to the other side of the yard, they get like purple and then they eventually get pink. It's very interesting. And so I have in the past fertilized them with the acid fertilizer and you know, can get them all blue, but it's kind of cool to have all the different colors. So that's what the anthocyanins are. All right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about leaves falling. Do leaves fall because it's cold outside? Is that why they fall? Why? What? What is the signal to a leaf to fall, Emma? When the days get shorter. When the days get shorter. So you can have a plant inside your home that will have that that's deciduous, okay, that will end up having leaves falling off of it when the days are getting shorter. Okay. So it does not have to do with temperature. Um, what is kind of an important part of that process of the leaves falling? Um what kind of cuts off flow to the xylem and flow flow on as the days are getting shorter? Anybody remember what that's called that kind of cuts the flow off the xylem and phloem ellery? The abscission layer. The abscission layer. Okay, so it's going to cut that off. Um, it's going to begin, the leaf's going to begin kind of cracking <coughs> and eventually the weight of the leaf will cause it to, to fully crack and break off. And so um, when that abscission layer, when that happens, it's cutting off um, the chlorophyll from getting, it's like affects the chlorophyll. And so that allows 
other pigments to um, also kind of kind of shine there. Um, that green is going to fade away, and you're going to have other pigments. Um, and and the weather and conditions do kind of affect the pigments. So if you've got sunny, cooler ottomans, you're going to have more reds, yellows, and purples. But if you're going to have more cloudy, warm autumns, you're not going to have the same kind of vivid colors. Okay. All right. And so that brown in the leaves, so some leaves are not going to have other um, uh, pigments in them. And they're just going to have the brown. And that's the tannic acid. Okay. And that's what I was talking about that, that combined, combined the iron that's in our teas, which is why we eat. And teas have a lot of good benefits too so i'm not like against tea and i drink tea but um you know you do want to be careful of the sugar and you don't want to overdo tea and little kids don't need to be drinking tea so what about plants that like i mean like we've got household plants that are like kitchen like basil and mint mm -hmm. why don't those lose their leaves is it well those are more going to be like the basil and the mint um they're just going to kind of die out at the end of the day. So basil is typically just, I think, goes as an annual, but the mint typically comes back. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you mint know. always comes back. Okay. Yeah. Um, and mint sometimes lasts through the winter here. Right. You're right. It does. Um, is it just like a I guess it's not deciduous. The whole thing's going to, yeah, the whole thing's going to die and come back. I'm sorry, but I can't give you the exact scientific reasoning behind that. Okay. Um, so let's look at 442, the on your own. Um, okay, there are a few leaves, such as the floating leaves of a water lily plant, in which the stomata and the spongy mesophyll are on the top side of the leaf, while the palisade mesophyll is on the bottom. In these leaves, which side would have? the darker green color, Miranda? The underside. The underside, why is that? Okay. <laughs> All right, so why would it have a darker color, Ellery? Is it because the chloroplast is so tightly packed that there's just more pigment on that side? So the palisade mesophyll layer, which Emma, you missed some of this. I felt like you missed like some of the most important little bit of the class right here. <laughs> um, I hate it, I hate that you missed that, but um, so, the, and I'll actually, I'll post the video so that you can want to go back and read, like fast forward at that one spot you can. But that palisade mesophyll is going to be the tightly packed area with the chloroplasts where the cytoplasmic streaming is going to happen. So um, wh wherever you're going to have the most chloroplasts is where the, the darkest green color is going to be. Okay, 14.9, if the leaf isn't green, does that mean there is no chlorophyll in it? Exactly. If a leaf has no abscission layer, what color will it be all winter? So it'll be green. So probably the basil and the mint don't have abscission layers too, so that would be one reason. One one thing that would be affecting it. Okay. So we've got like 15 minutes of class left. And what we're gonna do is I have made a copy of the module summary um, and I'm going to give it to you you guys can work on it together so we can, you can go ahead and do the part of the chapter we covered which is one through six although most of number four we haven't covered so you can skip number four some of number four we covered but not all of it not all of it's been covered in them. You guys can work on these together, um, and that way you'll have some work knocked out for next week. And I would say you have this, and as you're doing your reading each day, go ahead when you've read that section, go ahead and fill it out. And then you, since you're not studying Quizlets, I need to take that off the assignments um, for, ne for next week on the days I put Quizlet in. Go back and read through and study um, your Appendix B.